Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Sabir, pronouns he, him, and I run events here at The Strand. Before we launch into discussion of Heidi Seaborn's poetry collection, An Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until, after 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers, authors like Heidi, and journalists like Patty, we wouldn't be here today, and we are so truly appreciative of it. Tonight, we are thrilled to have with us Heidi Seaborn for the launch of her newest poetry collection, An Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe. After raising three children and a long, successful business career that took her all over the world, Heidi started writing poetry in 2016. Today, she is the author of the Pink 2020 Poetry Award winner, the book we're here to celebrate tonight, Give a Girl Chaos, and the 2020 Comstock Review Prize chapbook, Bite Marks, as well as chapbooks, Finding My Way Home, and Once a Diva. Heidi's won or been shortlisted for over two dozen awards. Her work has recently appeared in American Poetry Journal, Beloit Poetry Journal, Copper Nickel, the Cortland Review, the Greensboro Review, the Missouri Review, the Offing, the Slowdown with Tracy K. Smith, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, and elsewhere. She's the executive editor of the Adroit Journal and holds an MFA in poetry from NYU. Joining Patty in conversation tonight is Patty Sellers, an award-winning magazine writer, interviewer, and multimedia journalist. Sellers Easton Media co-CEO Patty Sellers is a former assistant managing editor of Fortune and currently chair of the Fortune Most Powerful Women Summit. Patty co-founded Fortune Most Powerful Women, MPW, which began in 1998 as an annual ranking of the top women in business and has grown to be the magazine's largest and most valuable franchise. It is the preeminent gathering of women leaders in business, philanthropy, government, academia, and the arts. Patty oversees six annual Fortune MPW conferences across the globe. Patty wrote more than 20 cover stories during her three decades writing for Fortune. Patty's resume includes groundbreaking interviews with Warren Buffett, Rupert Murdoch, and Nike founder Phil Knight, and definitive profiles of Melinda Gates, Ted Turner, former, treasure se tr former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Heineken, and many other leaders in global business and other fields. Sellers grew up in Allentown, PA, graduated from the University of Virginia in 1982, and started at Fortune in 1984. And so, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Patty and Heidi to the stage. We've lived <laughs> lives, oh, we lives. We both just pivoted. So um, I have told so many people that among all my dear friends, and you have been a dear friend for a couple of decades now, of all the people who have transformed their careers, pivoted so big time, <laughs> no one has done it as bravely and as radically as you have. And we're gonna get into your career and and you know your career from PR queen to poet, as I like to say. But first, um, I think you wanna give a little um, a little bite of your of your poetry to the group, right? Thank you, Patty, and thank you, Sabir, so much. And oh my God, Strand Books um, is well. Everyone has to go to Strand Books if you haven't gone. It's it's amazing. Um, I am going to read, and it's really fun to be reading from the second collection at um, at Strand Books because um, this book's called Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, and Strand was Marilyn Monroe's very favorite bookstore. Um, and I'm going to read a couple poems that I think are apropos to our conversation tonight. Um, I'm gonna start with one which is called Work. When opportunity failed to arrive like a taxi, I left home ahead of steam, took to haunting the clouded rooms, English leather, dark oak, 
cigar smoke. On stiletto heels, we could see the cards men held, the deck long ago stacked in the dealer's favor. Skirting around the boardroom, we forgot our places, elbow to seat, the table already set against us. But I bury my lead as women often do, fashion a story, charm becomes armor. We were armed, they were disarmed. Our lilting voices disturbing the papers piled on their desks, shuffling their order into mine. So this book is, um, is really a conversation between Marilyn Monroe, who I wrote in persona, and the speaker, who is a version of the poet, or which is a version of me. I know that sounds very confusing, but if you think about Marilyn, she was also a character that she created. So there's, there's a lot of um, layers of characters that exist in this book, but in essence, there are two characters, Marilyn and the speaker, who are talking back and forth in the middle of the night, in that sort of whispered, very um, intimate conversation. And they're discovering along the way that they have a lot of shared life experiences. And the poem I just read, I think is indicative of that, of having um, come up through a very male dominated work environment. Um, and the poems are in both Marilyn's voice in the speaker's voice. And in some cases it's a bit blurred as it can be in the middle of the night. So um, they could be either speaker um, or Marilyn's. But this one is, is definitely in Marilyn's voice. And, um, and it's a prose poem and it's called Reading Ulysses. And it's from a very famous photograph of Marilyn that Eve Arnold took where she is sitting um, outdoors at a playground and she's reading Ulysses. And I've used um, sort of the vernacular of James Joyce in this poem as well as some lines from James Joyce. Scholars call it parallax, me reading Joyce, I say pair legs to that, mine and Molly's, our skirts blowing up, showing cream muslin drawers. I wore white cotton panties, two pair doubled up for the scene that incited Joe to treat me like dirt. Yes, that's what I was reading when everyone assumed I was reading only the dirty parts. So that's why they wrote in the paper about me reading my first edition that I bought at the Strand and carried everywhere. So while the photographer was fiddling with the film, I pulled it out to read. And when she asked me if I liked it, I said, it's a slog, which everyone knows. But it's a bigger slog to be always in the kitchen to get his lordship breakfast. And it's a huge slog to break with the studio, move across country, and start your own production company. Now that's a slog. So when I slog through Ulysses, it's because I might just option it, hire a writer any director I want and play the role of Molly. I don't care what anybody says. It'd be easier for much better for the world to be governed by the women in it. You wouldn't see women going and killing one another, slaughtering. When do you ever see women rolling around drunk like they do or gambling every penny they have and losing it on horses? Yes, because a woman, whatever she does, she knows when to stop. Wow. So, so tell me about the origin of this relationship with between you and Norma Jean Baker. How did this all start? Well, it it started. I actually didn't. I was not a fangirl. Um, had never grown up thinking about Marilyn Monroe at all, and um, but I had I had written a book um, called Give a Girl Chaos and. It was based on sort of my long life of experiences, roughly, and I wanted to try something new because I was starting my MFA program, and I thought, let's have a project on top of going and getting an MFA. Let's just have a project that would sort of center those learnings, and so I decided to write in persona, and I was really interested in this idea of um, 
to where we are in with our culture and sort of the selfie culture, the performance culture, the idea that we are always on stage and we're curating sort of versions of ourselves, and in particular, celebrity and what it means to be a celebrity and what happens to women who are celebrities. And so in all of that thinking, I thought, well, okay, if I'm gonna go do this, I have all these curiosities. I'm gonna put them all together in one package and I'm gonna write in persona and I'm gonna write as the, the biggest icon there is and that's Marilyn, cause she's still there. I mean, she died 59 years ago this summer and she's still around. And so um, I embarked on that journey. And um, in the process, I learned a lot about Marilyn Monroe, about that era, about, um, you know, everything about her life. I, I did massive amounts of research and um, in order to really fully inhabit her persona and, um, and make it my own. Okay. So you did a massive amount of research. Yes. And in the, in the acknowledgements or in the notes at the end of this book, um, Heidi, it's just fascinating. The author's note, Heidi talks about the research she did. Just talk about, you started this process in the summer of 2018 and what you spent, you spent how long doing research? At what point did you feel ready to write in Marilyn's per persona? And just tell us a little bit about the kind of research that you did. Yeah, okay. Um, so I actually started writing in her persona right away, um, <laughs> but I staggered my research. So I initially, uh, I initially read a lot of biographies. I read, um, I went online and read as much as I could online, which there was a lot, but, but because I was an NYU student, I was able to go deep into the stacks of NYU's archive and read like like read the scholarly papers on her which is where i came up with that poem about reading ulysses because i was able to read the scholars on her um and and so i i did all of that the last thing i did in my research was to watch her films um and i i don't know why i went there but i kind of wanted to get at the heart of her i wanted to understand her childhood i wanted to understand her her adulthood i wanted to get through that and then understand how she performed um wow. and so i sort of sequenced it that way and i wrote all the way along and as i got deeper into her character then i was able to refine the poems and and make them more true to um to her voice as as i understand it we're going to open it up for questions. Anyone who wants to ask a question, please, uh, please start. I'd love to, I'd love to bring everyone into the conversation early and we'll go back to my questions, but this is meant to be a conversation. So, um, I'm very curious. What did you learn about Marilyn that surprised you? Um, well, there, there are a couple things. Um, one is I, I wasn't aware of how she used her power. And I think I think this is an interesting conversation for us to have because you have obviously studied power all your life as well and women in power. And to think of her, we think of her as being vulnerable. Um, we think of her in sometimes sort of sad terms and yet while she was alive, part of what she did was to assert her power over the studios. And the way she did it is really interesting because she sort of pioneered the idea of, of social media the way it is now, where you want you you want to have yourself, you know, every, on every platform all at the same time. And she did it by holding press conferences, by getting in front of cameras. She realized that if she could control the media story, the narrative, then the studio had to listen to her and had to come to her with um, with the deals that she wanted. And and so every time she was about to renegotiate a contract or she needed she needed some leverage, she would get 
make sure she was in in play with the media. Um, and um, I read this one scholar who was talking about sort of this thing and, and called it multiplicity and that she had really pioneered this idea, mm -hmm. of which I think is is interesting, really interesting. Um, that and, is super fascinating. And it makes me wonder if, if Marilyn were living today in this social media environment where she could control her media a lot better than she could back then, would she have lived a happier life, a more successful life? Would it have, how would it have affected her sanity, do you think? Well, I think um, it's, there's a complicated answer to a question. I mean, I don't know. So I'm, I'm supposing based on everything that I've learned. Um, I, I, I think social media and, and the whole environment that we live in creates all sorts of mental health issues for a lot of people. Absolutely. And so, you know, to say that, that this would be a better situation, it could be much worse. I, I also think that, that part of, um, you know, part of what she was wrestling with was this domineering world that she lived in, um, where the studios had control. They, you know, they had control over her physically. They had her psychiatrist had control over her. The husbands that she married had some control. You know, she so so maybe that would be a better environment because we have more power as women. Um, and someone certainly in her position would be able to assert herself in other ways. Right. But I think the media environment and the social media environment might make anyone crazy. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, the mental health uh, aspects of the, of the world, we're the social media world we're living in today are definitely, it's definitely more perilous. In, and yet, I mean, you know, this is a question that, neither you nor I nor anyone in the world can answer, but to the extent that Marilyn was that sophisticated about media way back then, 50, a half a century ago, you know, this is a question that can't be answered, but could she have been an Oprah Winfrey? You know, I don't know. Um, we have a question. I, like idea, though. I, really I know, like I know. Well, it's really interesting. It's super interesting to think that this woman who, who to us is the very symbol of kind of tragedy and vulnerability was actually like the thing that you discovered about her was that she was brilliant at controlling her image and, and, and sort of the, the media. So it's just, it's a really complicated question. And we have a question from my friend, Laurie Campbell. Laurie, thanks for thanks for coming on. My impression of Marilyn is that she was a loner. Did she have close friendships, people she could rely on, who tried to protect and help her? Uh, yeah, she did. She had actually quite a quite a few friendships, and um, and that that was fun for me to to see and to understand that um, she she was very close to many of the photographers. The uh, photograph that's on the cover of my book is um, from Milton Green. Milton Green was her producing partner for a period of time, and his wife, Amy Green, was a very good friend. The Strasbergs were good friends. Um, she was, she was, you know, friend, she she was very close to um, Pat Kennedy. So she's she had meant she had many friends, um, and. Uh, but she also had people who weren't so friendly and helpful. Yeah. Frank Sinatra was a friend, and then he wasn't, and then he was, and you know, so some some were some were better friends than others. Like 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 life. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So here's a heavy duty question from our friend Pat Ford, Heidi. <laughs> Did this immersion in Marilyn's story change your sense of your own life and purpose? Oh, wow. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Um, to, uh, I think I learned a, a, a lot. And I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's helpful sometimes to step out of yourself, right? And by stepping into someone else who was so different in so many ways, but looking for those 
places of connection, the, the life experiences that we had in common, and also the, the life experiences that were so, so different. Um, I, I think I came to realize, I mean, first of all, how incredibly fortunate I am to live in this time, to have been, been born from the parents that I was born from, having had a wonderful childhood, and to be, you know, to have had children. She, she was unable to have children. So to have children, to have, you know, to have this rich life and to be able to, to, to grow old and to, to, to write and, and to really write. And I think, you know, the other thing is that Marilyn um, wrote poetry and I think, you know, that would have been something that she would have in her older age would have come back to because she loved poetry. And I think, you know, so, so, yeah, to be for me to be able to have this sort of second, second vocation, second profession, whatever, as a poet, I I could envision that she would have done that too. And it was, you know, so that's sort of nice when you're in conversation with someone, even though they're a ghost or a mythical character, you do find out things about yourself. Um, you know, I think it's it was it was a really really wonderful exercise for me, and and I have a fun book out of it. <laughs> So Pat, who who comes from, who is a retired honcho from uh, from Heidi's old world of corporate communications and and a big role in the world of nonprofit communications, um, Heidi and I met in nineteen ninety or two thousand and seven when on during her first week on her in, in her new job as head of communications for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I was doing a big story for Fortune, a cover story about Melinda Gates. It was the first solo profile that Melinda ever did. And I met, I landed in Seattle where Heidi is now and and met Heidi for the first time. And, and it was her first week on the job and Melinda's first big profile. And oh my gosh, we had, we had our adventures, in, in, yeah. including yeah. getting locked in a parking garage, and I think almost being late for our our, our uh, my interview with Bill Gates. But anyway, so so um, Heidi became a friend after that. But Heidi, you ran you ran Burson Marsteller Europe. You were a senior high level executive at Weber Shandwick. Like you worked at some of the world's big high level positions at some of the world's biggest communications firms. And you were head of communications for the biggest foundation uh, on earth. And you just quit it all and decide to become a poet. That is just so bizarre. <laughs> Tell me about that. <laughs> um, so I, I wrote poetry as a kid, like a lot of people do. Um, and I and I walked away from it. I, I always thought I'd come back to it at some point, but I didn't. I you know, life got busy because of all those things that you said and raising a family and and moving, living all over. And um and so it became something I didn't really think I was going to return to. Um, I thought maybe I'll write a novel in my old age. But what happened was um, someone, I was having drinks with a colleague and he said, oh, I love to read poetry. I read it every night before I go to bed. And I said, oh, I used to write poetry. And then I started, I went back to my hotel room and I thought, God dang it, you know, like, I should try this again. And so I I took a class out here at Seattle. We're so fortunate to have the Hugo House, which is a really wonderful um, writer's institution. I took a class and literally two hours later, I was driving home from it and poems were just like coming out of my head. It was, it was as if, you know, there were seeds there and it had been watered and they were just growing and, and it just didn't stop. And so it took me another year two and and um i was consulting but i was consulting full time and and um and then i realized no i'm gonna go off and i'm gonna get this mfa and i'm gonna you know i've got i've got books coming out and you know this no this is this is what i want to do and um and so now it's it's become really a full-time 
thing and I edit and I write and I am fully engaged in it. And, um, and it's to me, not a hobby. I mean, this is, it's a um, extremely low pain <laughs> um, avocation. <laughs> yeah, it's an extremely low pain, but I look at it in a professional way. I, I approach it very professionally. I engage in it um, with the same sort of dedication and discipline that I always brought to my career. Are you, <clears throat> I mean, I just, I mean, I tell stories for a living. That's what I do. I, our company, Sellers Easton Media, is a storytelling company. We create content. I spent, you know, I built my career as a writer. By the way, my bio <laughs> is out of date. I'm no longer with Fortune. I left Fortune completely last October, but whatever. That was very nice. Thank you. But we tell stories for, <clears throat> you know, for, for clients. And I, I do ghostwriting and I do, you know, I write in the voice of people. I mean, what you did with Marilyn here is beyond anything that I could have ever imagined doing. But my question is, are you surprised at all at how you've actually made a great go of this? You're getting awards and you're, 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 you are a very successful professional poet. Does that surprise you? Um, yeah, it does. It does. Cause it's really hard. I mean, first of all, being a poet is really hard. And for, for all my poet friends who are on this, you know it, right? I mean, wow. How much rejection it's mostly rejection and a little bit of acceptance. And when you get acceptance, you do cartwheels and well, I still could do a cartwheel, um, <laughs> you know, you celebrate. And, and so, um, I feel incredibly blessed. Um, I do feel like there's, I mean, part of it is talent that you don't have any control over. I mean, it's just the poems come to you and you do your damn best to hold on to them and turn craft them into something that is going to, to resonate um, in the greater world. And, but, it's the holding on to that and and crafting it that requires that same sort of discipline and um, and f you know and and sort of real structured effort that I've always brought to everything I do. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised and I'm delighted and I also you know I've lived a a, a life so I have a lot to write about. You know yeah, I I don't do. I'm I'm more I'm more amazed in by some some of the young writers in my life who managed to write these gorgeous extraordinary poems and win awards and do all write books and and their lives are are short and so they're they're getting so much out of so little. So there's a question here from Ellen. Well, actually, first of all, Ellen says your poems from that class. I, the NYU class, whatever class, were just incredible and wow now with four exclamation points. So give a girl chaos. I don't know if the strand has it, but I hope so. Um, give a girl chaos is wonderful and and tells you more about this. That is Heidi writing as Heidi and, <laughs> and tells you more about Heidi, right? Yeah, I mean, you're it's still fiction, right? So, I mean, it's, but it's closer to my biography, right? Yeah. So I milked more of my biography in that collection um, to, to, and then I fictionalized off of that. Um, right. Obviously. obviously, you know, we always talk about the speaker and the poet are not the same person, but in that case, they were really closely aligned in, in Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, the poems that are from the speaker's point of view are again more closely aligned to me, but again, they're not they're not completely me either. Okay. So Ellen says it was the Hugo House class in Seattle, I guess. Right? I remember Ellen. Yeah. 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 So Ellen actually asks, um, Heidi, do you think that social media has helped to bring your book to a wider range of readers? Uh, or maybe, is this a different Ellen? That is how I learned of your book. So glad I did. No, I think that's the same Ellen. Um, I mean, 
so thank God for social media, right? Yes, yes, yes. And it's so good to connect with you. And yeah, I mean, of course. And, and um, one of the things that I've discovered in the five plus years that I've been writing poetry is how warm and collegial the poetry community is. And everyone is always supporting and uplifting each other. And it's really, really, really lovely. And so um, that's nice. As a poet, it's a, this p Twitter and Facebook and Instagram are really warm, engaging, lovely places to be. That's great. So yeah. it's not as cutthroat as the business world? No, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no money involved. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, the Strand Strand Bookstore just put up. You can purchase Give a Girl Chaos here. I'm glad to see they're they're good marketers, Heidi. They're really good. So my friend, I love saying her name. It's longer now since she's married. Paulina Maranova Pompliano. Hello, Paulina. Thank you for joining. She's my friend from Fortune, who's now doing a wonderful uh, newsletter called The Profile. Anyway. Paulina says, Heidi, so lovely to hear about your process. What was the most surprising thing that you learned about Marilyn? Oh, I asked that. And what were the characteristics you believe made her life story transcend generations? Yeah, what made her life story wow. transcend generations? It's, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because she is as big, she is probably the most prominent female icon in the world or and icon maybe icon in the world yeah and and you know she's been dead for almost 60 years so so how is that and i think there's there's a few things i mean one she died young and um and i think that when we lose someone at a young age they tend to take on that mythic quality um and there was just something luminescent about about her. I mean, beautiful, but smart and funny and um, and clever. And because she because she knew how to work the media, she was out there. And she and we you know we saw a lot of her. We have a lot of of, of visual images of her that that are in our minds. And um, and then she became somewhat mythic. And so there's so many books written about her and there's so much, um, there's so many social media sites and fan clubs and all sorts of stuff, which I have discovered. And she's, and she's, um, you know, she's, she's on, she's on everything. She's a brand and, and a very yes. successful brand. And so, you know, I think, I think that's, that's sort of interesting. Um, years and years ago, I represented the the Elvis Presley um, Family Foundation. I, and I I There's something <laughs> about your career I didn't know. And and it was it was interesting to kind of get behind the scenes and see what they were doing to build that brand out. And I think, um, I mean, the Maryland brand's been even more successful. But as a brand, if you think about it. Yeah someone who worked in branding, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Obviously not something that she has had any intention of, or has, has made, you know, her, her estate to not make any money off of it. Um, but that's the way it goes. So uh, we have a question here from Robin Kim. Hi, Heidi. What was the hardest thing for you about your researching and writing journey with Marilyn Monroe? And hello from your longtime fan, Robin. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. Um, hardest thing. The hardest thing. Researching was just interesting. Um, and it took me all over the place because, you know, you find some. I, I mean, I found letters between Marilyn and Arthur Miller that were available online and, you know, bits and pieces of things. And, and, um, I say this in my author's note at the back of the book, but the most useful, most useful thing I found was um, a book called Fragments, which was actually compiled um, in 2010, so not that long ago, from like two boxes of papers that were found in her estate 
uh, many years later, they found two boxes and in it were her journals, poems, letters, um, grocery lists, um, menus for parties. I mean, all sorts of stuff. And I took that and I turned a lot of that into poems. So that was really, really interesting, not hard, fun. All of it was actually fun. I mean, all of it's fun. I mean, to just sit around and write poetry and to be able to read stuff and then go and then go figure out how to turn into a poem is nothing but pure pleasure. I think the the hardest thing is um, because this was also my thesis, um, I had a time limit on it. So I started it in the summer of 2018 and I had to turn it in last summer and, um, or actually last May, I turned it in. And so I had, you know, that, that pressure of time to get, in my view, a whole manuscript done. Um, and, and I wanted it to be, I wanted it to work, to really work and not just be um, a series of persona problems of, about Marilyn, it had to have a narrative arc, it had to have a story, it had to have something that connected it. And so for me, the hardest part was then infusing more of myself into that narrative. Huh. And, um, and I don't know that I would have done it without being pushed into in that direction by my thesis advisor, Catherine Barnett, who was just like, no, you need to you know, you need to put more of yourself and it needs to be a, a, a dialogue. And um, and so that was that was hard. That was really hard because I didn't want to go there. But once I went there, it was really freeing and, and it ended up being a much better book, in my view. I actually want to mention a couple of, of, of poems, but let me ask you something first. Um, what so so you mentioned the narrative arc. What do you mean by that? Well, the story. It's, so there's a story. So so the um, when someone asked this the other night at a reading, they said, well, can you just pick up the book and read it any place? And I said, yeah, you can. But um, in most poetry books, you can. But this one, there's a biographical arc, which is Marilyn's story, although it doesn't quite flow biographically um, because I don't really get to her childhood until much later and in, in sort of a, a, a backhanded way. But the, the arc is, is me as, or not me, but the speaker, some version of the poet, discovering Marilyn, coming upon Marilyn, being fascinated, not able to, to get Marilyn out of the brain. And then Marilyn enters. And there's so this, this dialogue that happens between the insomniac and the other insomniac, which is Marilyn Monroe, in the middle of the night, this conversation between these two women and um and so that's it there's there there is and and mm -hmm. so the so the poems are they're sort of set pieces in a way and there's mm -hmm. and they and they talk to one another and so they and the voices toggle back and forth and so that's that's a lot of what's um it's very theatrical the way you yeah. describe it so is very theatrical the arc i think of you know when you put together a manuscript you are looking for something that's going to propel the reader from poem to poem to poem to poem mm -hmm. and, and each and and then make each of those transitions to the next poem richer so so they're gathering more information like you would in in a novel right how do you think this comes from chris is it beaver or deaver i think beaver chris beaver how do you think her childhood and abuse history impacted who she became and i'd like to just tag on to that question do we see marilyn throughout the book as the poems progress become more you know mentally ill i guess for lack of a better term yeah. um i th i think based on my research yes marilyn had um, childhood issues. She was essentially orphaned um, because her mother was um, mentally ill and, and institutionalized. Her father, she never really knew who he was. She guessed who he was. Um, and so, she, you know, she moved from foster home to 
family friends to an orphanage at one point, you know, back and forth and that, you know, very destabilizing, not having a real sense of, of, of family. And um, so I think we can all guess that that did. And, and based on what she wrote and yes, very much so this was, this was, and, and she was, she was forced to marry at age 16, the minute she turned 16 in order to stay out of an orphanage. So yeah, not an easy life. Um, and that's bound to, to, to create some anxieties that um, I think led to some of her issues in terms of sleeplessness, which then were medicated with barbiturates, which then led to other things. Um, and, and I, you know, and she was, she was institutionalized at one point, I think in, in error. Um, but, you know, I, I, my sense is, and obviously I'm not a Maryland scholar, but my sense is that, um, she had a lot going on and, and also had, um, an addiction issue that, got worse and it was it was prompted by her inability to sleep but it got worse and and it eventually killed her um but i think you know i i i think there she wasn't well served by her psychiatrist uh-huh. yeah i don't think she was well served by her psychiatrist and yeah. what you see in my book is you do see i mean i took her her letters from when she was institutionalized for four days um, mm-hmm. in Whitney, and I took that and turned it into a poem. Um, and I mean, she writes this very lucid letter, very lucid letter um, about her experience there and how and you know she does not sound like she's needs to be there based on her letter. Um, And so just sort of kind of capturing some of that um, destabilizing that happened later in her life as her addiction grew, but also um, I think some of the characters around her uh, did not support her in the right ways. So I'm looking at four days at Payne Whitney Psychiatric Clinic, 1961 here with lines from Marilyn's letter to her psychiatrist, Dr. Green. Greenson after being committed by Dr. Chris. I mean, do you care to read that or do you want to read something else? I mean, I, I think that's a super interesting example of you using the sort of archival material to yeah. write a stunning poem. Thank you. Um, sure, I can read it. Four Days at Payne Whitney's Psychiatric Clinic, 1961, with lines from Marilyn's letter to her psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, after being committed by Dr. Chris. I scrape my body off the scrawled walls, pinwheel on a stone bed, carve my lines into the steel desk. Very, very sick girl. Hold that thought. Phone gone. I call no one. Call Joe for old time's sake. Very, very dark place. Hold that thought. Each act an act, a line spoken, a rule broken, a small token from last year's movie. Sometimes I wonder what the nighttime is for. Cut, a girl said. She said cut. I called cut, the scene cut, into lines across the window. Cut, me in lines, open that window. Men are climbing to the moon, but they don't seem interested in the beating heart. Hold that thought. Um, yeah, so I mean, those that's scattered with lines that came directly out of out of that letter um including this that gorgeous line men are climbing to the moon but they don't seem interested in the beating heart wow wow she wrote that yeah she wrote that i mean amazing. that's amazing. I mean, it's just sort of amazing um and there's another poem in here um which where i think one of the other things that was really interesting was um when she was married to Arthur Miller and he was suffering from writer's block and he couldn't, you know, he was missing deadlines. He couldn't get any, he, he needed to deliver a new play. It wasn't happening in writer's block. And so she had to go to work in order to support them. Um, and so, you know, I have a, I have a poem about that. Um, and, yeah, sure. And, and, and it also has to do with, um, 
you know, she helped get him, um, she helped support him in his, um, he, he had to um, testify in front of McCarthy and the HUAC hearings and um, she, she got him out of that. In fact, he announced on television at the hearings that he was going to go off to London to be with his new wife, but, and that's how she found out they were getting married. Oh my so, goodness, wow. So that's all in here, uh, and including um, a little line that came out of a letter that he wrote to her. Um, there was no honeymoon. You ever think of getting married again? And there it is, just like the dog's vomit that everyone steps around. Oh, I loved Art all right, willing him free from McCarthy's clutches. I said I do. Said yes to be a stamp on his passport. So if your third marriage is anything like mine, you will call him daddy and discover he has written your dialogue in the margin. Everything's been scripted, but don't I love being told what to do? There is a fork for every course. And I knew at night to let him spoon the sweet cantaloupes of my rump. I knew to disappear into his white curtain, Connecticut appear for cocktails with his curious friends. Isn't she a wonder? I knew to quit work, to make babies, and when he drew a blank page from his typewriter, I knew to bury my unborn and go back to work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, she had to do what she had to do. Um, and he wanted her, you know, he, like Joe DiMaggio, wanted her to stop working and be a housewife, and yet she had to work. In mm -hmm. her so that's ironic. Boy, oh boy. Um, <clears throat> Liz Grady asks, did the conversation between you and Marilyn surprise you at any points? Did something arrive on the page that you were surprised by? Oh, that's a great question. And I would say yes constantly. Um, it was interesting. I mean, when I was writing, I just write, you know, I get up and I'd write a poem and I'd be working on it. And um, I wasn't certain, you know, I also wrote a lot of other poems that are during the same period of time in this two year period. I also wrote a lot of other poems that are now in a chapbook um, called Bite Marks, but it, but sometimes I'd feel this like, it felt like a little tap on my shoulder. Like, Hey, this is, this mine's mine. This is our poem. This is, this is the one that we're working on together. And I, so I could feel that sort of, and I don't mean to be woo woo here. I mean, I'm just sort of sensing that collaboration that you have um, with, and many poets have this, they have a collaboration with another writer where, you know, you're just sort of deep in their work. Um, I did a reading the other day with Diane Seuss, He's got a wonderful book out called Frank Sonnets. And um, Diane was talking about sort of her interaction with Frank O'Hara and feeling sort of the presence of, of him in her work, kind of guiding her work. And for me, it was very much Marilyn doing that, sort of guiding me in how to tell this story and how we were going to um, collaborate on both her story and my story together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this relate, my friend Scott Saffon is is my good friend. Scott is on the is is watching, and he asks a question about um, what your thoughts are about the future of um, future of poetry. We now have this amazing young woman, Amanda Gorman, who everybody knows about. What is that going to do for the poetry industry? If I can put those two words together, maybe that's a no-no. Um, and um, also, Heidi, I mean, here we are at the Strand. What do you think about the future of bookstores? Wow. Wow. Okay. Two very big questions. Thank you, Scott and Patty, um, for elaborating on it. Well, okay. Let's just say. I think poetry is having, they're talking about having like a, another golden era. And I think it's true. And yeah, God love Amanda Gordon, but it goes back to really having been in lockdown when so many people who had never picked up poetry, picked up poetry. And 
started reading poetry and writing poetry and feeling the need for it in their daily lives, feeling and being able to make space because maybe we had space or we needed to make space. And so we, so many people I know said, God, for the first time in my life, I'm reading poetry and it's meaningful to me and it is now part of my life. And that to me is really exciting um, because Gosh, it is, you know, if it, it the, the whole reason you write is one, because you have to, but then also because you want to make a difference to somebody. You want someone to read your work and say, oh, I can relate to that, or I, that makes me feel in a certain way. And then you, you want that emotional response. And so I do feel like, um, like poetry is having a moment, and I want this moment to last forever. Um, what do you think we need to make this moment last? Because I mean, it's, it's, to me, it's both like wondrous and kind of like, okay, now we need more people like Amanda Gorman out there. And she's so one of a kind. And what do we, what do we need to, I mean, you've become a little bit of, of an expert through this book on cultural moments and cultural phenomenon. And um, what do you think, what do you think we need or what can we do to help make this, to help, to help fuel the movement? Well, it goes back to the other part of your question, which is go to the Strand and to other bookstores, <laughs> go to your local bookstore and go to the poetry section. One of the things that I do everywhere I go, and fortunately I'm going to start getting to go places again, but I always go to the local bookstore and I ask, where's your poetry section? And sometimes I have to get down on my butt and just sit there and look at the bottom, this little tiny bottom row. And it's got Walt Whitman, you know, maybe Emily Dickinson, you know, it's just, it's, it, now it'll have Amanda Gorman, but she might be up by the cash register, which is wonderful. But we need to have, we need to create demand. We need people to buy our books. And I'm going to say something. The, the poets don't make money on book sales, but the bookstores do and our presses do. And we don't, you know, that's not, we don't get a lot of money from it. So buy poetry books in order to keep these small independent presses and bookstores alive. And um, so that's the really important thing. And the, the really amazing thing about poetry is that there are so many journals. I'm executive editor of one of them, but there are hey, so the name of the adroit journal. Okay. Very prominent journal um, started by a very young poet. He was 15 at the time. He's now 26. Wow. That's my boss. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but there are thousands of journals, and so you can find poetry everywhere. And there's 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 hundreds of wonderful small presses publishing books, but they don't get distribution. And we need to get them out into bookstores, and it's all supply and demand, people. So yep. we need we need some demand out there. We've got the supply. <laughs> The Adroit Journal, a link is on, is in the chat. Uh, Heidi, are you, are you happier uh, in this life uh, than you were in your long and very successful business career? I, I loved what I did before and I love what I do now. Um, so degrees of happy, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, um, I mean, they're just so different, right? It's such a different existence from how I lived. And um, and the work is different. And this the, is the- I'm gonna just finish, but there's the joy of creating something. And I had joy in building something, but this is a joy in creating something and putting it out into the universe. And hopefully it resonates. Yeah. I was going to say in one word, this is the what part of your career? The, the what part of my career? I mean, creative, whatever. That's okay. No, you explained um, it. Well. I think it's, I 
think it's the rest of my career. It's the rest of my life. I mean, I, the one thing that's different is that this is not something you retire from. Right. Uh -huh. Right. right. This is not, you know, this is, this is now who I am. So it's a different thing than this is what I do. This is, it's more who I am. And that is a, that's a big difference. That's a huge difference because we always did not want to define ourselves by our work, by our jobs. And now you want to define yourself by your work, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Before we close, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, can you, can you leave us with a, with a poem? Sure, thank you. And first of all, before I, I do this um, last poem, I want to thank you, Patty, my dear friend. You're welcome. We're always having a wonderful conversation, and I can't wait till we are together and can do it in, in long drawn out over a glass of wine. Um, and thank you so much to The Strand and um, Xavier, thank you so much. You were such a wonderful host. Um, so to Siver and to Patty and to the Strand and thank you audience. And it's so fun to see friends from all parts of our lives joining us tonight and to meet some new people. And I look forward to seeing you um, again sometime soon. Come up and tap me on the shoulder with Marilyn. All right, this is the very final poem in the book. Um, and it's called Then I Slept. And to me, it was, it's also a poem about, um, about, about where we were. I wrote it last spring um, in the pandemic. So there's, there may be a, a feeling for many of you of how, how, you, have, of, how you have weathered the, the pandemic and how we feel right now, that sort of sense of relief, I hope. Then I slept. First, there was the lemon peel of morning, then the empty space in the bed, still warm, my love's body held in the slight indentation, then the clatter of his oatmeal and tea, and beyond that, a neighbor's whistle, a dog's rugged bark, a man calling out as a door, car door slams. I slept in, slept through the night. I slept through Ambien's dark fist pressing my pillow slept all night. My love questions God's existence, but I hear the weather is warming this week. Our plum tree is cotton balled. The heavy perfume of Daphne drifts through an open window and a hummingbird whirs over the forsythia. In the stacked white boxes up the hill, the honeybees doze. I, hope, I wish all of you a really good night's sleep. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Heidi. It's a gift and an honor to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you. Uh, before we close, I just wanted to say thank you for such an interesting conversation. Uh, to our audience, if you have yet to purchase a copy of An Insomniac Slumber Party with Marilyn Monroe, there's a handy green button center of your screen you can click on. And 10 lucky people will get this sleep mask with a line from the poem or from a poem on it oh, it's very cool <laughs> and on that note everyone have a wonderful evening thank you so much <laughs>